first reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and it's on page 793. 793. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next reading can be found on page 1204. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and, once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the third reading is John 12, verses 20 to 33, and it's on page 1080 of the Church Bible. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many more seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered, 
Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for these readings. Father, we pray for your anointing here. The anointing that breaks the yoke. The presence of your Spirit leading us into all truth. Come, Holy Spirit. Move in this place. Build your kingdom here. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be here, and thank you, Martin, very much for inviting me. Um, These uh, verses that we've had are quite tricky and absolutely stacked with uh, deep theology and uh, very important things. But I just want to bring out a few things. Uh, You all know that we're in the the season of Lent, and it's been mentioned uh, a couple of times already in the service. But I do want to just ask you, um, what is Lent for? Can I have some suggestions? What, what, what is Lent for in the calendar, in the church's annual calendar? What, what's it for? Turning around, repenting. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm hearing lit words form on your lips. Preparation. Preparation. Yep. Anything else? Reflection. Very good. Anything else? Sacrifice to the Lord. Good. Cleansing. I'll put up with a crackling in the background. It's the storm. Anything? Sorry. <coughs> Suffering. Okay. Anything else? We we'll have, we'll have two more. No chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you, darling. <laughs> it's my wife. Uh, anything else? One more. Spring. In what sense? Spring. New beginnings. So it's the time just before new beginnings. Preparing for that new beginnings, perhaps. Preparing for Easter and chocolate. Do you ever feel like this first picture? Um, Just for those who are only hearing it, there's a picture of a Christian who has got his head buried in his Bible Uh, literally just sort of dumped, arms hanging down, and really in despair. Well, there is a legend that comes with this, um, if we can have the next one. God put me on the earth to accomplish a certain number of things. Right now, I'm so far behind, I will probably never be allowed to die. (laughs) Yes. Well, isn't it interesting that we, we laugh at that picture. Uh, and it's not like that for us all the time, is it? But, it, but perhaps it is like that sometimes. And I, I want to ask some questions to start with about why it is that we sometimes feel like that. It captured me because there is inside me, there are inside me certain voices which judge me uh, as to whether I have accomplished enough. 
Uh, and that's a very interesting and a very important thought. Um, and sometimes it, it also illustrates for me the despair that sometimes comes across my heart that I will ever make it or that I will ever be good enough for God. So let's just very quickly uh, look at, um, we can have that one off for the moment, um, our internal values and the settings that we have within ourselves and our personal philosophies. I listened to Martin's talk on the 1st of March when Martin spoke of to kill a mockingbird. He spoke of the worldview that led in that story to a huge miscarriage of justice. I don't know if you remember it. It was a very powerful talk, which I have to say I appreciated hugely. And all of us have heard probably that idea of having a worldview. It's how we see the world around us. And our worldview affects the way that we interact with the world around us. We ask questions and we answer questions, uh, maybe knowingly, but maybe unknowingly, about what God is like, about who I am, what I am, how do I live, what my values and priorities are, uh, and very much how we survive in a hostile world. Does this ring bells for people? Yeah. How do I survive? And um, the question for us all, really, is where do we get those values and those voices from? We need to understand and discern the strong messages that we're bombarded by. It's very, very important. We are bombarded by Western modernist philosophies uh, and the theologies which have been infected by a Western modernist worldview, which basically says that things like um, intellectual prowess, my mind, will overcome everything. Um, and if I can just learn enough, and if I can be clever enough, and if I can be logical enough, particularly you've got, um, I think that's Aristotle, is that right? I think it's Aristotle's picture up there, but it's just he just represents Greek philosophers. Okay, so we've been actually quite infected by Greek philosophy, which says that intellectual uh, accomplishment and logic will overcome all the problems that we face in the world, just in the way that we see things and so on. But we also need to know that we are bombarded by advertising and TV programs, peer pressure at school and at work, and the inner desire, which we all have, and this was something that Martin picked up, was that we have an inner desire for comfort. And if I could just be comfortable, then everything's going to be all right. And this can infect the church, and sometimes, and particularly in the society that Martin spoke about in To Kill a Mockingbird, it was speaking about the desire for comfort that was prepared to put up with huge injustice for the sake of an, what Martin called an uneasy peace. So where do I get my information from is really a very vital question for us as believers in the Lord Jesus. Where do I get my affirmation from? Where do I get my information from? Of course, we all um, understand that that is, in some, to some degree, we understand that that is the challenge for us as believers. And you come here today to hear somebody talk because actually there is a hunger to desire more uh, wisdom or depth. And I pray and have been praying that you will receive some of that through this talk today. I, um, I'm a great fan of uh, Henry Nguyen. I don't know if, or sometimes people pronounce it Nguyen, but he's a, a Dutch, I haven't got a picture of him, but he's a Dutch guy 
um, a Catholic priest who um, had a very eminent um, academic career and he went to go and live, he had a breakdown and he went to go and live in a community of people who were very severely uh, mentally handicapped and, and disabled. And he said that living in that context stripped away all of the values that he held so highly and, and, and actually shaped his life in the academic world. And actually what he discovered was something about loving people, which wasn't anything to do with those values of being clever and having a professorship and a PhD and, and, and a good education and so on. Those people stripped away from him the, the, the sort of scaffolding. And he found that very difficult and profoundly shaping. But he preached in a very well-known, well, it's a sermon that you can find on YouTube, and I, I uh, recommend it. It's, it's called Being the Beloved. Uh, and he said that our lives are a short span, and um, we can sometimes get our value and our, our sense of being from I am what I do. We can also get it from I am what I have, and I am what other people say about me. And I'm sure all of us, in some, to some degree, can identify with that because when somebody says something hurtful to me, it hurts. So the logical response to that is, well, I'm going to try and work so hard that nobody says anything nasty about me so that I'm not hurt. It's kind of logical, isn't it? Just in the, way that, in the same way that um, children respond to um, certain situations where they think, well, because this has happened to me, I must be bad. And we get voices which stick in us and shape the way that we live our lives. And I, so, so I want to talk about, not, not talk about it, but I just want to mention at this point that reputation, I'll just say the words, shame, performance, success, failure. So if we take the message that the world gives to us and then impose it on God, which is projection, if you can see what I'm saying, we project that onto God, then we are going to start beating ourselves up about having missed the mark. And of course the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or the standard that God requires of us. So we, see, we can be those, and that's where that first picture came from, we can be those who seek to be the best Christian that we can be. And we become slaves of our job, of our performance, or our possessions, or what other people, our reputation, what other people say about us. And Henry Nguyen says that if that's the case, then we are going to, he took a felt pen, and he, on this line he drew this sort of big zigzag. We go up and down and up and down, dependent upon other, what other people say or how well we're doing. Now that's not okay, because that is, that is, uh, that is subject to something that we can't be sure about. And so we're going to end up exhausted and feeling that we can't do well enough. I know that when people preach that uh, the congregation, because I've been that person, can go away sometimes, that he's just notched up another 10 things on my to-do list. And I go away thinking, well, I haven't done last week's, and I haven't done the week before that. And we just go away feeling condemned. I do not want that today. That is not the message today. And of course, I just want to identify this, this problem, really. Jesus said of his people and religious people, and I don't want to make any distinctions at this point, 
He said that um, there were those who came, will come to Jesus, say, but I, but I prophesied. And I've done this, and I've done that. And I've healed people in your name. What does Jesus say? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So lawlessness was because it was all about them. Did you see that? It was trying to do it because it was all about me. I was thinking of having a t-shirt. It's all about me. And it, and it isn't about us. That's, that's the point. And of course, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about works which end up being burnt up by fire because they're wood, hay, and stubble. They are nothing. In the light of his glory, in the light of who he was, and in the light of his original purpose for us, they're nothing. And it bothers me, and it grieves me, and it challenges me personally about what is done within the church that is actually nothing. What is done that's nothing? What am I doing that is nothing? So the question is, how is it possible that we can get it so wrong? And how can we start getting it right? What is it that's right at the heart that is so fundamental to understanding what God's plan is for us that we can start getting it right? And we can start building silver, gold, and precious stones. Those things which are going to last the test of fire in the end. There is another way. And so if we can have the next slide. And it's the way of the seed. Let us uh, use Lent to ask the Lord to purify our hearts, to refocus our direction, and to clarify the fundamental word. Now, do you remember in the text it says that the father spoke over Jesus and said, today you are my, my, I'm your, become your father and you are my son. It's all about relationship. It's all about that relationship of father to son, father to daughter. It's about knowing who we are. It's about knowing what we are. there's some good news and there's some bad news and the bad news of course is that that seed that's on that picture there will remain alone until it dies so the seed principle which is right there from Genesis if you remember seed and harvest seed time and harvest right in the Genesis chapter 1 that is the principle of the universe seed time and harvest that the seed is sown the harvest grows and more seed is brought into being. But there's a multiplication principle in the seed dying and then the cycles of the seed. And so if we could have the next one. Then. You can see there that this, in this picture, a bean grows root, starts growing a, um, a shoot up. And eventually it ends up with no vestige, nothing of the seed left. It's just a husk that's just gone away. It's gone. But what's left behind is something that has the capacity to multiply the original. So a seed has within it the DNA, the potential. It's dry potential. But it has to be sown. Jesus said you must be born again. John chapter 3. You must be born again. The old dies and the new is born. And it's born of the Spirit. And Jeremiah, chapter, uh, Jeremiah 31, which we haven't got anything for particularly uh, in terms of this, says that it's not like the old covenant. Do you remember that? So it's not like the old covenant where there's this ongoing sense that we have to keep on going round and round in circles. 
Now, the interesting thing about that is that it was a covenant. The new covenant was to be a covenant that was written on our hearts. Now, if I give you a list of things to do, can you see that that's something that is imposed upon you? Can you see that? It's imposed upon you. You have to do what I've imposed upon you. But can you see that when the covenant is written on the inside, it changes everything because it's what I want to do and it's what I want to be. And it becomes part of my nature. So God is promising a covenant that is completely different from this business of a to-do list which never gets fulfilled. And the seed and the death speaks of the fact that this has come onto the inside of me and I can start to be the person of the kingdom, of the spirit, walking in the spirit, living in God's ways. Not because of obligation anymore. That's the old covenant was obligation. And the new covenant is, well... Let's have some words. How do you, when, when I talk about the difference between the first and the second, what feeling does it give you? Freedom. Absolutely. That's what I've got down in my notes. It's freedom. And of course it was for freedom that Christ set us free. It was for freedom. And of course in, in Galatians we know that it says that do not be tangled again in the old way. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. You are my son. You, today, I've become your father. So it's not from the outside, it's from the inside, and it comes up from within. This is the covenant, the nature of the covenant that we are called into, and that we've been given. And of course it came about by Jesus being sown as a seed in the ground and dying. And the DNA of this new covenant is exactly that journey that Jesus went on. He went on that letting go, releasing, submission, suffering, which was mentioned in when we talked about Lent, suffering. And what did he learn through his suffering? He learned. Sorry? Somebody said it. Obedience. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And so, actually, there's something for us. There's a good news message for us. That what is true of the covenant maker needs to be true of us. That we engage on that journey with him and we say hands up I let go it's your business I want you to come and speak this and write this in my heart so that I am no longer struggling to tick all the boxes praise God now Lent is one of the times for reflection and I have to say that you know, in practical terms one of the things that helps me to identify where I am on that journey is something that is hidden in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, who have debts or sinned or transgressed against us. God knows I have some projects in that area where I keep on getting tense on the inside because I find it difficult to choose to forgive again. Okay, so I'm just saying that this is a way of knowing where we are. How much have I really let go? That's a helpful little thing just for us, I, I believe. R.T. Kendall in his book about Joseph says how grateful he is to a priest who pointed out that he had a need to do something which they came, they came to call total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. I die. It's not about me anymore. I choose to forgive so that I may be forgiven to the same extent. 
But the good news is that this is all about resurrection. It's all about resurrection. It's all about the 30, the 60, and the 100 fold in the parable of the sower. It's all about that. Life, fruit, multiplication, eternal life, the joy of the Father. And of course, one of the things that we have to be prepared to let go of is our reputation and sometimes things like shame and words that have been spoken onto us. We have to let go. We have to be prepared to look stupid for God sometimes. Being faithful in a dark corner that no one will ever see. But, we'll, but we've got to see that we're, not, we're free because of the covenant being written on the inside rather than trying to do it. So we have to let go to receive, then to see that to be obedient and faithful in that secret corner that nobody ever sees is actually a joy. Set free. Praise God. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So if we can have the field of wheat, that would be nice. Uh, then there's the multiple, the, 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 you know, the hugeness of the harvest. It's amazing. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and I'm lowly and, I'm, and you shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. You see that? And the yoke is his partnership or covenant, covenant relationship. Is this easy? Death is never easy. John 12, 27, Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Save me from this challenge. Save me from letting go. Save me from having to forgive this person. There isn't another way around, actually. Father, glorify you. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. We're called to walk the way of the cross, be courageous, discover the work of the Holy Spirit in us. I'm coming in to finish now. And I hope that's been a, a kind of helpful set of thoughts. And it came up with, uh, at the beginning when people were praying and people mentioned that it was by his stripes that we're healed in, in Isaiah 53. It was by his stripes that we're healed. So what I want us to do now is finish by coming into a place of prayer. Some of the words that I may have used may, trigger off, may have triggered off some of t- one or two things in one or two of your hearts. And as I was praying for you in terms of coming here and just saying, God, what is it that you're saying? Um, I felt that there were people who were hiding. Not, 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 um, not in a critical way, but just have hidden things that have been said. Hidden words, hidden messages that people have put on your life that you don't want to tell anybody but they still dominate and they still hurt and they still limit what God wants to do. So we're going to come now to a time of prayer. Um, And it's just to give all that we are. Uh, And I've got some words that have come up so we can just say them together. We'll have some silence at the end. And then I'm going to surprise you all. That's put you off, hasn't it? <laughs> it's not fair. I'm going to sing you a little uh, chorus that, um, that has been very helpful to me. So let's just focus on our hearts for a moment and just ask God to come by his spirit and give to us the sense that what it is that we need to bring before him right now. And let's say these words together. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I give you everything today. My hopes, my dreams, my failures, my successes, my pride, my disappointments, and secret shame. I give them all to you now, as a seed I sow. I ask you to take my life wherever you want, to take it, to use me however you want, to use me or to rest me. Write your story in my life. But it is your will, not my will, I want done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's just take a moment. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day.